Good morning, Bowtie Nation. Joseph Hogue here. Thank you for joining us for another Monday market update. Get you ready for the week. Stocks to watch, news to highlight. Got a great video for you this week. They say that within a crisis are the seeds of an opportunity. And the quote is attributed to both Marilyn Monroe and Albert Einstein. Don't know which one actually said it. I could see where the confusion comes in. But the, in the recent collapse of regional banks, we are already seeing those seeds of an opportunity in the larger banks, in the greater uh, financial sector seen in those larger banks gaining tens of billions of dollars in deposits. I'm going to explain the largest bank, how that's working out, what's happening, and how that could benefit some of those banks, five largest banks that actually could get stronger in this crisis. Before that, I do want to highlight a special offer from Seeking Alpha. Use the link I'll leave below. You're going to get 50% off premium access. It's about $8 a month. It's less than I paid when I signed up a few years ago. And you get some great features on this. And I'm going to use some of the research in the video today. You're going to be able to learn, listen in to company earnings reports, conference calls. You're going to get those stock screeners, be able to find the stocks with the highest buy ratings by analysts and a lot of other features. So click through that link, check out what you get and sign up for that. Onto our main topic though, because that crisis in bank stocks does not look like it's going to be over. Uh, we had shares of First Republic down 26% on Friday. That's despite getting a $30 billion injection from the 10 largest banks. 10 largest banks, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Bank of America, banks like that got together, said, hey, we got to bail out some of these regional banks before the crisis gets too bad and gets to our shares. So they got together, put $30 billion of their deposits in First Republic, and it was still down 26%. Okay, that iShares US Regional Bank ETF, that's the ticker IAT, it was down 34% in the past month. So we're going to go over the reasons for the crash, why this is happening, and how it could start to improve, and how it could actually come to benefit some of these largest banks that we're going to talk about. First, understand that the two failed banks, that's Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, and then Signature Bank, SBNY, to something completely different from what the rest of the regional banks are going through right now. I'm going to detail why that is and, and what's happening there. But you see, with the rest of the banks, the regional banks right now, when a bank wants to use all those deposits that people are depositing for it, right? It has to use that money to earn a return. It can't loan out all the money because that would be just too risky, okay, if those loans don't get paid back. So what it does, it has to split up some of its deposit base, some of its assets into uh, into super safe treasury bond portfolios okay it's investing in not even corporate bonds uh, which are usually very safe as well but treasuries backed by the united states government it holds these in two buckets one is available for sale one that uh you know it can it can sell those bonds if it needs cash needs th things like that and then held to maturity bonds okay those are this other group is you know they they they're going to hold those until those bonds mature they can get all the interest and the par value on those back and the problem is with the Fed hiking interest rates by the fastest pace in 40 years, that's caused some unintended consequences, something that we're just starting to see right now. That has caused treasuries to fall by as much as 20%, the value of treasury bonds to fall by as much as 20%, because when interest rates go up, then bond prices go down. Okay, so anyone investing in those bonds sees their portfolio fall. Okay, uh, we saw that in a lot of those bond ETFs last year. But what happens is obviously, you know, if interest rates in the market are higher, then you don't want to buy those old bonds because the interest rate on those was so much lower. So those of prices have to come down to make the yields balance out and make those older bonds attractive to new investors if, if those people want to sell those bonds. So that's what happened. A lot of these banks holding those buckets of held to maturity and available for sale bonds, those treasury bonds, have seen those portfolio values go down so far that uh, that there's a, there's a fear that those banks are now insolvent, that they don't have enough assets to cover the deposits if their depositors uh, came came calling for their money back, okay? Now that said, there is no reason why this should get any worse, okay? Those held to maturity bonds are still worth face value as long as the bank holds them, holds them to maturity. Those one, three, 10 year bonds that those the banks have, there's no reason why they have to sell those unless they get a run on deposits like we saw with Silicon Valley Bank, with Signature Bank, with some of these other regional banks. Uh, beyond that, the banking ratios for solvency are ext extremely strong. Loan to deposit ratio at banks, at U.S. banks, is the strongest it's been in 50 years, lowest it's been. Uh, tier one capital requirements, uh, tier one capital 
ratios are well above the regulatory minimums. And to further head off the crisis, the Federal Reserve came out with a special funding window last week. Okay, Banks could use their high quality assets like treasuries. This held to maturity portfolio. They could use that as collateral for a loan from the Fed. Essentially, the Fed is making a loan on these long term bonds to correct this problem that itself caused by moving those rates so fast. And we saw that banks actually borrowed $164 billion from this backstop last week. So that's where we're at with the larger regional banks and the larger financial sector. I wanna talk about briefly why SVB and Signature Bank were different, why those two bank failures shouldn't happen to a lot of the other regional banks, and why this could actually be an opportunity for some of these larger banks. SVB or Silicon Valley Bank was almost completely focused on tech company deposits, startups, biotech, tech companies. This wasn't a consumer bank like you usually think about where you go down and deposit your money into a bank. 97% uh, of the deposits from this uh, from this bank were large multi-million dollar accounts from startup and tech companies cash. Okay, these these startup companies that have hundreds of millions of dollars in cash on their balance sheet, you know, because they're burning quite through quite a few of it each month and each year, they hold their their bank hold their money with Silicon Valley Bank and then withdraw it as needed. Well, when that means when cracks started to appear in that bond portfolio, then the word spread quickly that the company and the companies should withdraw their cash. Okay, venture capitalists like Peter Thiel rushed out to his uh, to his tech startup investment companies and he told them, hey, you know your um, your your money might be in danger if it's there in SVB, so I'd take it out quick. And of course, that run on deposits, when everyone asked for their money all at once, that caused the bank to fail. They had to sell those bond portfolios at a loss. They didn't have enough money to cover those deposits. But you don't usually see that level of uninsured status with most banks. If we look at some analysis here by Wedbush Securities, we've got the percentage of uninsured deposits at regional banks. So you've got Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank up on top here. Now remember, any kind of deposits you make in a bank are insured by the FDIC up to $250,000. So anything above that is not insured. And that's what we found with a lot of these companies that park their cash, their balance sheet cash at banks. Anything over 250,000 is uninsured uh, for a bank failure. So a lot of these companies fearing that bank failure took their money out that caused a crash in deposits. Now, even at First Republic though, the next highest uninsured ratio next to the failed banks is only 68%. So uh, other regional banks like Keycor have more than half of their deposits insured. Much more, most of these regional banks, as well as the larger banks, they are much more consumer oriented. You're not gonna have $250,000 or more in your bank account. So the average overall banking system right now is about 50% insured. So with most banks, even those smaller regional banks, you don't have that level of fear that if the bank fails, you're gonna lose your money, okay? 50% on average of deposits are guaranteed. We had the Fed come through and guarantee all the depositors for Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. And now with the Fed borrowing facility where banks were able to put up their long-term bonds as collateral for that $164 billion in backstop, there is no reason why this should get any worse. Because remember, deposits are a bank's earnings power, okay? You deposit your Money with a bank, it's going to take a portion of that. It's going to loan it out at higher rates. It's going to take the rest and put it in treasury, still earning a return. Even safe short term T bills right now are earning 5%. Okay, with none of that interest rate risk, uh, with the crisis focused on these regional banks, we're going to have, we're going to see as much as a trillion dollars, as much as a trillion dollars in the regional banks is uninsured above that FDIC limit. We're gonna see a lot of that coming out and going into some of these larger banks. And I think that's where the opportunity is in these banks. One of the biggest beneficiaries of this could be Bank of America. It's already estimated that it's seen at least $15 billion in deposit growth just from the SVB fallout, okay? That's beyond all the other banks, the regional banks were seeing their deposits fall. Those deposits have to go somewhere, folks. These, these million dollar, billion dollar companies can't just take their cash out and just hold it in a safe in their office. They have to deposit it with a, with a bank somewhere. They're gonna go to these largest banks and Bank of America is already benefiting from that. Bank of America is the second largest bank in the US by deposits with over $2.4 trillion in assets. It's got the lowest percentage, one of the lowest percentage in uninsured deposits with just 33% of its deposits above that FDIC guarantee. So it is one of the safest as far as that FDIC insured, uninsured ratio. It has got a $2.4 trillion in assets. 
And despite that strength, shares of Bank of America are still down 20% in the last month and trade for just 0.95 times on a price to book valuation. Okay, that is a 19% discount to its long-term value of 1.17 times price to book and it's paying a dividend yield over 3%. JP Morgan, ticker JPM, is the largest US bank by deposit. So that's with $3.2 trillion in assets. It does have a little bit higher, about 59% of its deposits are uninsured because it focuses a little bit more on capital markets, on newer companies, things like that, but it is still extremely safe. Shares are down 12% since the crisis began and trades for 1.45 times book value. It's about a 7% discount to the long-term average. Now, JP Morgan's strength and its size just makes it safer than a lot of these other banks, even the larger banks. That's why the shares are not down quite as much. Uh, JPM has also reported strong deposit growth and is actually making plans to shorten the wait time that, to open new accounts as well as promising faster access to that. That cash for the newer company deposits. So a lot of these banks, JP Morgan included, are making taking extra steps to be able to bring that money from those companies that are withdrawing their money from SVB, from Signature Valley, from a lot of these regional banks. They're making it extremely easy for those companies to come over and deposit their money with JP Morgan. A U.S. Bancor, ticker USB, this could be the best opportunity here. It is the largest regional bank, so it is technically a regional bank in the United States, but it is actually the fifth largest bank overall with $585 billion in assets. So this is a regional bank. Uh, it doesn't have quite as much capital market exposure as some of these large banks, uh, but it has lost 33% of its stock price in this crisis. So we're, we're seeing that same weakness in regional banks here at USB, but it actually is more of a larger bank with, the, uh, with that huge deposit base. That size means plenty of liquidity and the shares now trade for 1.27 times on a book value basis. That's 1.3 times book value. It's about a 25% discount to the long-term average and it's paying a 5% yield to wait this out. Goldman Sachs, ticker GS, is actually only the eighth largest bank with $487 billion in assets. Really surprised me how small the bank actually is. Not exposed to a lot of the regional banking fears, much more of a capital markets bank with investment banking and, and that kind of thing. It's only 33% of its deposits are uninsured. Again, it's much more capital markets focus. So I'm thinking it also gets a bigger slice of those shifting depositors. Okay, companies that are going to be looking to strengthen that relationship that could mean investment banking and fixed income profits for Goldman Sachs later. Uh, shares here are down 17% over the past month, trades at a one times book value. That's about as low as I've ever seen it on this stock. And while I think most of the pain is over here, while I prefer those larger banks on that safety play, if you do want to invest in these regional banks, okay, so pick up some of these bargain opportunities, I would start doing it by this broad ETF first though. The iShares US Regional Bank, that's the ticker IAT, that ETF, that's going to give you exposure to more than 140 plus banks in that regional bank idea. It's going to give you a 3% dividend yield while you wait for these shares to rebound after a 34% plunge in just the past month. I want to turn it over to some of the stocks I'm watching this week. First up, energy stocks here. We can see the XLE, the Energy Select Sector Spider. That's the sector, sector ETF for the energy stocks, ticker XLE. Stocks in this sector were crushed last week with all 23 stocks in the S&P 500 down. Five of them, Halliburton, Schlumberger, uh, APA Corporation, Marathon, and Devon Energy, all down double digits just in the past week. You can see here the XLE, the sector ETF, was down 10% alone in the past month. While I do believe a recession is coming, it's not going to be that hard, and, and we should get strong support from energy that, at this level. Uh, we're going to talk about this in the sector outlook, how we're going to get strong support for energy prices here between $68 and $72 a barrel, and why that is. I'm using the sell-off here to get back into some of those favorite names like Devon Energy, that's ticker DVN, ConocoPhillips, ticker COP, Diamondback Energy, ticker FANG, and Chevron, ticker CVX, some of the strongest energy names in this sector. I think they get a lot of support here and you need to be watching these, especially this week. GameStop, ticker GME. It's going to be reporting its earnings on Tuesday with a lot of investors watching this one. Expectations are for a loss of $0.13 cents a share on $2.1 billion in sales, but 
this one might be actually one of the best of the meme stocks. I actually started researching this one, uh, looking for cracks in the story here, but you know, comparing this to some of the other meme stocks like Bed Bath & Beyond, uh, Best Buy, this is actually uh, probably one of the stronger ones, which still isn't saying much. Com company hasn't made a profit since 2018. That's before the pandemic. It's gross margin, so that, that gross profitability has fallen from 35% to just 22% in that time. Uh, and its operating expenses have been rem remained stubbornly high at 28% of sales. So despite sales falling so much, the company really hasn't done a good job of lowering expenses as a, percent as, as a percentage of those sales. Uh, that said, the upside against these others is that GameStop has taken advantage of just that meme frenzy to issue shares and pay down debt. So it's not really this overburdened now with those interest payments as we see with Bed Bath & Beyond, as we see with some of these other meme stocks uh, out there. In fact, it has a net cash balance sheet with over $466 million in excess cash over debt. So it could pay off all of its debt, still have almost $500 million on the balance sheet. That's going to give it a lot of room, a lot of flexibility. Short sellers are back to 21% of these sales shares outstanding. Uh, so I'm thinking, you know, any kind of good news, any news other than bad could be another short squeeze for this stock. General Mills, ticker GIS, look at that, up 26% over the last year. You don't generally see that with these consumer staple stock up that much in the past year. It's going to be reporting its earnings on Thursday with food companies actually holding up relatively well this year and over the last year, as you see here. You know, companies like GIS, like General Mills, they got hit early with the inflation uh, a couple of years ago, but are now making it up on, on those cost cuts as well as just passing those prices on. On to consumers. This is something we talked about last year, how a lot of the consumer staples companies, they were hit first by the inflation. They weren't able to pass on a lot of those costs on to consumers. Uh, so they took a hit in the profitability. That is now starting to, to reverse. And uh, Wall Street is expecting 9.5% earnings growth to $0.92 cents a share for the quarter for General, General Mills. $4.18 a share for 2023 in earnings. Stock isn't particularly cheap here at about 19 times earnings, but it's not expensive either. Uh, so this is a, a good long-term stock here, 2.7% dividend yield. I want to highlight the sector trends here, especially what we're looking at in energy stocks right now. Here we are on the sectorspider.com. Great resource, the sector overview, sector tracker here. You can see what the sectors of the economy did over the past five days, six months, year, all the way up to five years. And we can see here that last week, seven of the 11 stock sectors actually closed higher last week, a particular strength in tech and communication services sector. So you got your tech stocks down here up 5.6%, communication services stocks, which is not only telecom but a lot of those internet social media stocks up 5.3% big, big up week for those, uh, for those sectors, uh, for the most economically sensitive stocks, the cyclical se sectors, you see here, energy, financials, industrials, and materials all fell on that fear of a recession, fears that a banking reset or a banking failure could push us further into a recession. But two things really surprised me though, you know, first is that despite that growing fear of a deep recession, these growth stocks in tech and, and internet names just boomed. Okay. You don't generally see those, uh, those growthy kind of sectors take off when investors get worried about a recession. Second is just the vast difference here in the up sectors versus the down ones. You know, more than 10% difference here between uh, financials and energy stocks falling more than 5%, and then the stocks that were up, the communication services up 5.2%, technology up 5.6%. So again, while I do believe there will be a recession beginning sometime here in the second or third quarter, I don't see that banking crisis as particularly severe or the cause, right? We've already seen how those higher interest rates are pushing us, pushing the economy closer to recession. So in fact, the weakness in bank stocks could actually keep us from a deeper recession because it means the Fed is not likely going to raise rates quite as much as it planned. Okay, we had, we had already expected the Fed to raise rates at least another three times at its meetings. We're now only expecting maybe one or two times. So the fact that the banks are, uh, you know, are showing some weakness, I think the Fed is going to pull back on its interest rate hikes, and that might actually save the economy from a deeper recession. Banks are still very well capitalized. No depositors have lost money in this. Uh, so if that view is correct, that you know, even if we do get a recession, it's going to be a fairly mild one, it means that sell-off in financials and energy is overblown and blown, and the stocks in these sectors could rebound over the next month. 
beyond that, I'm looking at energy stocks down here with energy prices, oil prices down at $66 a barrel. That is the point where you start getting OPEC, a lot of those exporting countries saying, hey, this uh, this oil price isn't high enough to cover a lot of our country's budget deficits. We're going to we're gonna pull back on production to kind of support that price. That is also right around the uh, below the price that we've seen the administration. The Biden administration has promised to start buying barrels of oil between $68 to $72 a barrel to start refilling that SPR, that Strategic Petroleum Reserve, that it took 400 million barrels of oil out of last year. Um, that, that reserve of our nation's oil stocks or oil, oil reserves is down to like a 40-year low. They have to start refilling that. They've already said they're going to refill that right around $68 to $72 a barrel. Oil is now below that point. So I think that is for some very strong demand support for oil, and it's going to start pushing oil prices back up. We do get that all-important Fed meeting this week. The Federal Reserve is going to wrap up its meeting on Wednesday, going to increase interest rates. Now, before the banking crisis, and this is what we just talked about, before the banking crisis, the uh, the market was putting odds as high as 40% that the Fed would increase rates by a half a percent. Okay, that is more than it's been increasing in the last two meetings. The last two meetings, it only increased rates by a quarter of a percent. But the market was believing that because inflation is persistently high, Fed's going to raise it by another half a percent. And a 0.25% rate wakes was a certainty. Now, the crisis has just changed all that. Like I said, the crisis may actually cause the Fed to pull back on its rate hikes, not raise quite as much or for as long. There's now a 76% chance of just a quarter of a percent rate hike even a one in four chance that the Fed pauses on its increases. Now, I do believe that the Fed will increase rates by about a quarter of a percent this Wednesday. Uh, it has to keep that it has to keep that cr credibility that is fighting inflation and not going to be, you know, losing its eye, losing, taking its eye off the target. But just that fact that the Fed is now slowing down its rate hikes, it is going to be pausing pretty soon and eventually cutting those rates just uh you know just to support the economy that is a plus for the economy and for stocks use the link below and take advantage of that special offer from seeking alpha get more than 50 percent off premium access or click on the video to the right for the seven dividend kings that will never let you down dividend stocks with more than 50 years of increasing dividend payments don't forget to join the let's talk money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification